Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, just want to say, echo what Brian said. We appreciate everybody being here on the teacher work day. Um, it is a little bit later this year because we did switch our attorney firm. Um, and obviously, we're going to talk about um, coaching and kind of extracurricular relationships. Most of the people in this room know that um, probably, or not really probably, I would say the most powerful relationships that adults and schools have with the students is really in these environments, this kind of coaching um, situation. So it's a very powerful um, relationship that you guys have with students. And with that relationship comes a lot of responsibility um, and some things that you need to do to make sure that that, that we're good and that we stay legal. A big part of this presentation is also going to be about just best practice things and things that you need to do to protect yourself. So we want to make sure that you're here and that you kind of pay attention to what um, the attorney is going along with here because a lot of what um, this can be is just if you do it this way instead of that way, then it ultimately protects yourself. So again, we have a positive relationship. So at this time, I'll turn it over to again our lead school board attorney now, Richard Shores. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here uh, on a teacher work day, and uh, we'll try and get through this in a little bit over an hour. Uh, this is going to be a, a uh, back to basics uh, review of legal standards and a little bit of a legal refresher. Uh, it's going to be a lot of things that you should not do, uh, but I want to focus a little bit at the outset on the positives. As Dr. Ladder said, you develop some of the strongest, if not the strongest, relationships with kids in our school system. There are an awful lot of kids that you save every year. There are a lot of kids that stay in school and thrive in school because of the relationships that they develop with you. Um, I grew up son of a coach. Uh, when I become a principal and an assistant superintendent and superintendent, um, I would run through walls for the coaches that I had in high school and in college. Um, there are strong relationships and, uh, and you are meant as your role models. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today. We're not going to get into nitty gritty about high school athletic association rules and regulations. We're not going to talk about Title IX. We're not going to talk about concussions. Um, we're going to talk about some basic policies and, uh, and some recent cases. So um, with that said, um, I want to and I want to apologize for the technology problems we had at the outset. Also, um, hopefully we'll, we'll still get you out of here on time. So um, let's talk about safety and supervision. Probably the most important thing that uh, that you have to deal with in your jobs as uh, folks dealing with extracurricular activities. Um, how many of you in here are coaches? How many of you are something other than a coach? Okay. How many are band directors? Okay. Um, I, I, when I was growing up, I was uh, I was on teams in, in high school. I, I uh, uh, was a varsity athlete in college, um, and I was in the band. Um, safety and supervision is really important, not just on the ball fields or on the, on the courts, but also with the band. Um, I had more serious injuries with the band than I did wrestling um, or playing baseball. Uh, so the band. Uh, Bad folks pay attention here too, if you would. So um, let's talk about uh, liability for physical injury and what your duties are. There, if somebody, somebody gets injured, they can have a claim against you or against the school system for that injury, depending upon whether or not you satisfy some basic duties. And there's a basic duty of care that's owed, and it come, along with that duty of care comes the responsibility for reasonable supervision and instruction. It doesn't have to be the highest standard of care, although that's what we might want, uh, what we might strive for, but it has to be reasonable. Um, you can't be negligent is the, is the legal term. Um, and that includes not only supervision, but also instruction. Um, it also includes the use of proper equipment and making sure the premises and facilities are safe. If you know of some dangerous areas uh, on the school premises or on the facilities, it's incumbent upon you to, to make sure that kids stay away from those areas. It's incumbent upon you to make sure that they're reported to the principal and that they're followed up on. But that's all on you, and you're likely to be the first one who knows about unsafe premises or facilities. If somebody does get injured, obviously prompt and appropriate care after the injury is significant and important. And then also, it's really important to make sure that in activities, you have the proper selection and matching up of participants. Um, for example, if you've got a wrestling team, 
don't do what my high school coach did, which was match me up with the heavyweight because even though I was a lightweight many weight classes ago, um, I was a good enough wrestler that I was getting the lightweight, so he matched me up with the heavyweight. Um, rules and guidelines go into sport matter. Uh, transportation also, we'll talk about some transportation rules and regulations. So those are all the things that establish the duties that you have, the duty of care that's owed to participants, to the kids. And then the next question is, have you breached that duty and so forth? Have you violated that duty or not fulfilled that duty? And if so, was there an injury that resulted from that breach? So you can, have, you can still have a, you can have a breach of duty and a separate injury. The question is, did the injury result from the breach of some duty that was owed? And if so, are there any damages? Is there any actual injury or damage? Um, and that is how we end up with liability in the subject of safety and supervision. So um, we have responsibilities for students and the responsibilities to supervise students before, during, and after school if we know that they are going to be on school grounds. So if you know that kids show up on the practice field 15 minutes before you're out there, somebody needs to be out there supervising them. Um, if you know that kids are in the band room warming up before you get there, somebody should be in there supervising them. Uh, school policies have to be followed along with school hours, and it's really important whether or not it's a school-sponsored activity or event. If it's not a school-sponsored activity or event, are you involved? And if so, how are you involved? And what's that relationship? And how does it change if it's a private activity or event? Um, we'll talk about that a little bit as well. All right, for safety and supervision, you should have some risk management thoughts. Uh, all throughout your activities. And the risk management should cover things like following policies and procedures, proper training and supervision, taking corrective action when needed, reviewing, updating, refining, revising policies and practices. If something's not working, figure out what needs to be changed. <clears throat> uh, legal counsel and support, we're getting that now. Uh, keep track of injury. What was the sport? What was the type of injury? Was there any equipment involved? Was, there, was it defective equipment? Uh, was it old equipment? Was it worn out equipment? Uh, was it a particular piece of equipment? Have you notified anybody that there was a problem with that piece of equipment? If you knew about it before. Um, where did it occur? Was it on a what facility? Where on the practice field? What location? Um, all of that's important for following up in terms of potential liability. Assessing risks is also important. For supervision and instruction, make sure that you are properly supervising all athletic activities or any other extracurricular activities. And make sure that whoever is dealing with the activity knows what they're doing. Uh, make sure that that person is qualified for the job and that they understand their responsibilities. Um, this is really important with new coaches, with new assistant coaches, with folks who haven't done it before. So make sure that they understand, not just that, okay, you're the assistant coach, congratulations. Make sure they know what they're doing and understand their responsibilities. Um, it's really important that you tell kids what risks are involved in different activities. And that you do that up front at the beginning of the season, not after it's two or three or four or a week or a month into the season. And that they get properly instructed on uh, proper techniques of what playing, whatever sport they're dealing with. Providing and maintaining adequate athletic equipment is really important, or any other kind of equipment for group activities. Um, and these are just a laundry list of things that you should be considering. Maintaining an inventory of all equipment used, and it should be identified by age and manufacturer. Somebody should have that, whether it's the athletic director or a coach, somebody should have that information available. And then condition, the equipment should be inspected at the start of the season and then periodically throughout the season at various points in time. Um, and somebody should be designated the responsibility for maintaining uh, that equipment and the safety of the equipment. Make sure that everybody participates in orientation and a safety checkout before they first use the equipment. And make purchases of equipment based on appropriate safety considerations and specs. That'll be done, I'm sure, for at the central office level. Um, and then, uh, are, are we going to have any waiver agreements for anybody else using athletic facilities? So if people come in on the weekends and use the gym, we're going to talk about that a little bit. Community use or access to school facilities. 
or if you're involved with a company or an organization that rents out the uh, uh, facility over the weekend, you need to make sure that there is a written agreement for that. If there's not an agreement in writing, then there's potential liability. If there is an agreement in writing, then the school system is immune from liability. We're going to talk about that a little bit later on as well. And then maintain records of any warranties and user manuals for equipment. Uh, transportation, we will talk about safe transportation a little bit later too, but here are some basics dealing with assessing risks. There should be transportation policies in place, um, and we're going to talk about your transportation policies. Um, if a private transportation carrier is used, if you use coach buses, for example, uh, for big trips, if the band is going to the Thanksgiving Day Parade in New York City or something like that, um, make sure that you're using appropriate transportation carriers, um, that their safety record is checked out, that they've got all the appropriate licenses and inspections as well. Uh, maintain records of the vehicles that are used to transport athletic teams. That, of course, is done at the central office level. Um, and establish uh, an accident reporting policy and evaluate any accidents. And then, of course, driver's license record checks should be done. These are all pretty basic. All right. Let's talk now about standards of conduct, moving on uh, beyond assessing risks. Uh, the conduct of any of you has to be beyond reproach. As Dr. Ladder said at the beginning, you are the consummate role models. Uh, you are the ones that people look up to. You're the ones who really carry it forward for the kids. Um, and you've got to be beyond reproach. Um, you're up here, whether you like it or not. Um, you're elevated in the minds of a lot of kids and a lot of people, uh, and that's a it's a heavy burden to bear, um, but it, and it's a heavy responsibility. But it's it's one that you bear well, and uh, it, it goes almost without saying, but it must be said that your conduct has to be beyond reproach. You are the role models, um, and you, it's also important to keep in mind that you're employed at the discretion of the school system. So uh, uh, that's also significant. And keep in mind that Board Policy 7205 standards of conduct applies to all employees, including folks who are involved in extracurricular activities. So let's look at that standard of conduct. In the Board Policy, there are some very, very high standards of conduct. And the first is to treat everybody with respect. Second is obviously not abuse any student. There are a lot of laws on the books and a lot of policies dealing with sexual abuse of students, um, dealing with physical abuse of students. Why do you think that is? Because it's happened. Um, and it, it, it happens, unfortunately, uh, in my line of work, I see it happening a lot more often than anybody would like to know about. Um, so be very careful about this, um, obviously, as well. Uh, the language that is considered profane, vulgar, or demeaning is prohibited. Uh, even if you're out on the football field, even if you're on the basketball court, um, even if it's in the heat of battle, uh, you cannot use profanity. Uh, obviously, no sex with a student, uh, no uh, uh, written, verbal, physical uh, solicitation of a sexual act over the internet or otherwise, um, and no sexual harassment or harassment based on uh, ethnicity, origin, race, etc. Um, the term romantic relationship, as used in the policy, includes uh, dating any student, but it also refers to soliciting any student. Uh, another standard of conduct is to maintain confidentiality. You're going to get, you're going to get confidential information. You'll get confidential medical information. You'll get confidential student information. Um, it's very important to keep that information confidential. If somebody asks you why did this person play, um, you can say they're injured. Um, or you can say, uh, you know, it was a, a personal issue or a medical issue, but you can't disclose what that was, right? You gotta be careful about that. Uh, uh, you're required to maintain uh, confident, uh, constitutional and civil rights of a student, um, and not to misuse any public funds or property of a school or an organization. Now, I wanna talk about that for just a second. And, and booster clubs, okay? We're not gonna get into booster clubs in any kind of detail here, but stop and think about this requirement. Shall not misuse public funds or property or funds of a school-related organization. That's what the policy says. Now, booster club funds are not public funds. 
but they are the funds of a school-related organization. Right? And a lot of booster clubs kind of bleed over, and they do great things, and they support a lot of the activities that you, we want them to support in the schools, and they may do great things for your particular sport or activity, whether it's the band boosters or the football boosters or the softball boosters. Right? But you've got to be very careful that they're not bleeding over into the point where they are, you are misusing funds or they're misusing funds. Uh, it's uh, several times a year that I end up dealing with cases with band boosters, I'm not, with uh, booster organizations that end up uh, misusing funds or borrowing funds or the school system ends up doing things with the booster organization that shouldn't have been done. So be careful dealing with your booster organizations. Make sure everything's on the up and up uh, with them. Uh, avoid confrontations uh, with co-workers, and, and not only that, avoid, avoid confrontations where the employee knows or should know that they will result in disruption. Um, and, uh, all right, let's move on to the High School Athletic Association. I do want to mention uh, just a couple of things from the High School Athletic Association handbook. Um, and this is probably the most important thing I'm going to say all day today. Set a pattern of behavior so that the students are better for having been coached by you. Same thing with a block if you're the band director. Um, it doesn't, you're not obviously subject to the High School Athletic Association handbook, but that's the standard. Leave things better off than before you touch them, um, and don't touch them, uh, by the way. But uh, 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 the bottom line here is set a pattern of behavior so that the students are better for having been coached by you. Um, your primary role is to educate through athletic participation. Um, promote physical, mental, moral, social, and emotional well-being with players, and foster good sportsmanship and promote respect among teammates, and then follow all guidelines and rules of the High School Athletic Association, um, as well as the board policy. The Cabarrus County Handbook incorporates an awful lot of the rules from the High School Athletic Association, but it also goes beyond that, and you've got a terrific um, in this school system, you've got a terrific athletic handbook. Um, it's very thorough, very well, very well done, and it gives you great guidelines. But here are some highlights on that. Obviously, if you violate the High School Athletic Association guidelines, you're subject to paying fines and penalties. Um, I just got done dealing with a case from the High School Athletic Association where a couple of baseball coaches were suspended, in part because they were having illegal practices, but also because the booster club led over into what they were doing, and they were um, providing tremendous facilities and advantages for the baseball team, uh, but also they were providing some uh, advantages that should not have been provided. Uh, I don't want to get too much of the weeds on, no details on that, but um, two coaches were suspended and they were fired and they went from coaching uh, for a year as a result of that. Um, Non-faculty <coughs> coaches and non-faculty head coaches Make sure that their character is beyond reproach and their employment is temporary and on a renewable basis. Services can be terminated at any time um, in the discretion of the school system. Uh, coaching positions are supposed to be filled by faculty members whenever possible, and any potential falsification of prior experience um, is grounds for removal. Uh, you to schedule a minimum of three days for tryouts and make sure that parents go to the preseason meetings. Uh, to review all policies. This is really important. Get the alphabetical rosters to the athletic director and do that in a timely manner. Um, check student grades at the end of the first semester to make sure they're still eligible and make sure that everybody's enrolled in the accident insurance program. And then make sure that team rules are reviewed and approved by the athletic director before you implement them. Um, this is a great cover your butt rule, okay? Um, it's really important to get those rules covered in advance so that you've got backup. When you go to those parents or somebody disagrees with the rule, you can, you can tell them that it's been approved, you've got the athletic directors who should be backing you up on this, and uh, it's beyond common sense, it's a great cover your butt rule. Um, and then, no rules should violate freedom of expression. What about kids taking a knee? Has anybody had the experience of kids taking a knee yet during the national anthem? Nobody. 
Really? Nobody? Okay. All right. I'm surprised at that. Um, uh, if it hasn't happened here yet, it probably will. Um, but is that a rule? If, if you have a rule against taking a knee, is that a rule that violates freedom of expression and can it be enforced? We're going to talk about that a little bit later. We'll talk about the national anthem and pledge of allegiance and um, get you locked out of participating in that. All right, there are some other policies I want to talk about, and uh, the bottom line in these policies is don't do it. Um, and this deals with staff and student relations. Uh, obviously, romantic and sexual relations are prohibited, even if they're consensual, um, they're criminal acts, and there are also restrictions on electronic communication. So let's talk about some of these. So for the electronic communications, um, if any one or more of these um, circumstances exist, it's okay. You don't have to get prior approval. So the things that you can do for electronic communications, and this covers all manners of electronic communication, okay, whether it's Instagram, Snapchat, whatever it may be, direct messaging, email, text messaging, um, if it's for an educational purpose, you're fine. If it's conducted through a school system platform, you're fine. Um, and if it occurs after the employee has, been given, has given prior notice to the supervisor. Uh, also, if it serve, it, another option is if it serves an educational purpose and is copied to your supervisor and upon request of a parent or guardian, or if it's necessary in a bona fide emergency. So if, uh, what is a bona fide emergency? Well, it doesn't have to be that the bus crashed. It can be that the bus is delayed um, and you need to notify people. That's fine. Uh, or if you have a relationship with a kid, a pre-existing relationship, they're, they're your niece and your nephew, or you're um, a youth group pastor in the church and they're part of uh, your youth group organization, uh, any kind of prior pre-existing relationship, you're not prohibited from communicating with kids if you have such a relationship with them. Um, also, in the same policy, you have the duty to notify supervisors if you get some unsolicited communication, one-on-one uh, -on -one communication from a student that lacks a clear educational purpose. Now, what does that mean? It's pretty broad. Um, but if a kid text messages you um, or sends you an email and it has nothing to do with school or the team or the band or whatever organization you're with, um, and it's kind of sketchy. Uh, you should notify a supervisor. This is another make sure you're covering yourself provision. Uh, any violations of this policy will be considered unprofessional behavior, uh, which could have adverse consequences for you. So uh, I don't want to take that to the, to the extreme. If somebody texts you and says, what's up? Um, I think you're OK. But if they're texting you and saying, hey, coach, want a party tonight, um, that's a different story. All right? <clears throat> uh, some relevant factors of determining whether or not you've got a violation of these policies would be, would be these right here. Um, the content, the frequency of the subject, and the timing, the appropriateness of the age and maturity level, the level of the student, whether it's reasonably viewed as a solicitation of sex or anything that could be considered sexual grooming. I just got done with a case where a teacher was involved in uh, an incredible amount of social media messaging, always with ladies, young ladies, and it could be very easily perceived as sexual grooming. Um, and uh, the uh, cautionary tale here is that the teacher involved uh, didn't believe that any of this stuff would survive. Um, he thought it was, most of it he thought was stuff that would go away um, after a short while. Well, even given some of the media, media he was using, um, which does, the, he was using some messages that do disappear um, after a while. He wasn't counting on the fact that kids were taking screenshots of those messages and saving them. Um, were taking screenshots and then posting them and sending them to some of their friends. Um, so that's, uh, that's a concern. Uh, whether there was an attempt to conceal the communication is also significant, as well as whether or not there was any disruption in the educational environment or any harm that came to the student in any manner. Um, if you have any idea that anybody else is doing this, there is a mandatory duty to report it that is contained in this policy. 
Um, if you know of anybody who is involved in any kind of behavior like this, or if you've witnessed anybody else behaving uh, inappropriately using social media or otherwise. Um, another policy I want to call your attention to is policy 4302, dealing with management of student behavior. That policy prohibits corporal punishment. We have a law on the books now that says that school boards may prohibit corporal punishment, and your Board of Education has done that. All right, but what is corporal punishment? Corporal punishment is now defined in the law and is defined in this board policy as the intentional infliction of physical pain upon the body of a student as a disciplinary measure. So stop and think about that. The intentional infliction of physical pain upon the body of a student. Okay? You don't want to be accused of that. All right? But while that includes things like spanking and paddling and slapping, it doesn't prevent you as a coach from making kids run suicide drill. Okay? Much as your kids might want to say, wait a minute, that's corporal punishment. It's not. Okay? It can still have them run suicides. Um, you can have them uh, do anything that will develop athletic skills, teamwork, physical endurance, and strength. All right? Just be careful that you don't push them to the breaking point. And some of the worst cases I've ever had have been with kids who died on the field. Okay? Because they were pushed to the breaking point, or because of the, they were on the football field and it was 100 degrees out, or uh, they weren't allowed out of water breaks, or things like that. So be very, very careful about um, the conditions when you are developing teamwork, endurance, and strength. Uh, let's talk about the North Carolina Code of Professional Ethics for Educators. Um, this is a state board of education policy. You've got a local board policy that kind of mirrors it. But this applies to anybody who's got a license, an educator's license in North Carolina. And it talks about the commitment to the student. Obviously, protect the student from conditions within the control of certain that learning or are detrimental to the health and safety of students. Maintain appropriate relationships, evaluate students, and assign grades. And this is really TBD. Um, discipline the students justly and fairly in a way that does not deliberately embarrass or humiliate them. Um, I've, I've, I'm dealing, this week, I've been, since yesterday, I've been dealing with a case involving a coach who called out three girls on the volleyball team. And he called them out in front of the teammates. And he told the teammates what these three girls had done, um, what they had been saying and doing in the locker room, and embarrassed and humiliated them in front of the rest of the team. Right? And the father uh, of one of the girls wants this guy's license revoked. Okay? Now, as far as the coach was concerned, he was trying to set a standard for the team. He talked about if you do these kinds of things that these girls were doing in the locker room, if you say these kinds of things, it's demoralizing. It kills team morale, it kills team spirit. It causes people to break up among the team. And we got all be together. That was the way he was approaching it. But he went a little bit too far in talking to the rest of the team about what was going to be done to these three girls, what the consequences were going to be, and, um, and had them standing up in front of the, girl, the rest of the team. So be careful if you're disciplining students, if you're disciplining team, um, if you do it in a way that does not deliberately embarrass or humiliate them, that's actually grounds for revocation of your license. Okay? Um, and then, this is really significant. Holding confidence in the information that you've gotten and that is confidential, and then refuse to accept significant gifts, favors, or additional compensation that might influence or appear to influence professional decisions or actions. So for example, if the booster club has a big donor and the big donor's son wants to be the starting pitcher on the baseball team, and you're the baseball coach, and the big donor says, well, I've got a practice facility here in my, my house, and you and the team are welcome to use it at nights and on weekends, including Sundays. And the team can come out here on Sunday and you can just come hang out and watch them. Okay. You're really skirting the dangerous, you're, you're touching dangerous grounds here. Not only with Sunday and the possibility of Sunday practice in violation of high school association regulations, 
but also in terms of the perception of you being influenced. All right? Suppose the, the, the donor's son now becomes a starting pitcher. And there's some question as to whether or not you've got it on merits or because you're getting some side benefit. So be very careful about that. And also be very careful about accepting gifts, favors, or additional compensation. Now, some of you are probably involved in camps, um, coaching camps. Some of you may have your own coaching uh, uh, jobs on the sideline, uh, tutoring as a coach, uh, for example. You've got to be very careful about that, particularly if um, you're doing it with kids who are on your teams during the school year. So be careful about that. Um, and, and I want to emphasize that, uh, that point that just got highlighted again about discipline kids in the way that does not embarrass or humiliate them. Um, no hazing. Uh, again, some of the worst cases that I've ever had dealing with athletics came about from hazing, uh, with kids who were being uh, uh, initiated into the team. Uh, it's almost always going to be the younger kids, it's almost always going to be the weaker kids, it's almost always going to be um, the kids who don't know any better um, and, and are scared to tell. Um, so hazing activities can, uh, can get you into an awful lot of trouble. Um, there's no longer a team tradition of hazing. You can't say, well, it's been going on here for years, it's our tradition, it's what we do, it's what makes us great, it's what makes us a team. It builds camaraderie. Well, it's also against the law. Um, it's also against regulations. It's against high school athletic association policy. Um, and regardless of a student's willingness to participate, that's really key. Um, hazing and any other humiliating activities that are expected for a student to belong to a team or group have negative consequences and are not part of a wholesome athletic environment. If it's been going on, if you know what's going on, stop it. All right. And let's talk about oops. Okay. Uh, sexual activity. There are a number of criminal statutes here. I'm not going to go into a great deal of uh, uh, detail on this because it should be obvious that you don't do it. Um, and uh, if you are letting this is this is sexual activity with a student. It's a criminal law. Anything that starts with the chapter 14 in uh, here is a criminal statute. Um, if a defendant who is a teacher or a coach at any age and who is at least four years older than the victim engages in intercourse or sexual act at any time, then that's a class G felony. Now, you may say, well, great, I'm only three years older than some of these kids. Um, there are other statutes that cover you. All right? Um, consent is not defense. There is no ability to consent to this kind of sexual activity. Um, the same thing is true with taking in these liberties with the student. It's a separate criminal activity. Um, hazing is a criminal activity. Um, so it is actually a criminal activity for any student to be involved in hazing. So if your seniors are hazing your freshmen, um, and they're, they're a violation not only of athletic association rules, local board policy, but it's a criminal offense. Um, here's a case that you all may be familiar with. It's only a couple of years old, uh, less than two years old right now. It's a good kind of of appeals case, and it happened right down on 85 at East Gaston High School. Okay, not too far from here. All right, and this was a high school wrestling coach who had been a wrestling coach for almost 20 years, and there was an awful lot of hazing that was going on in the wrestling program that um, ended up in, involving sexual activity. Um, that was highly inappropriate, but it was a pattern of behavior and abuse that went on for years and years and years. It was part, became part of the culture of the wrestling program at East Gaston High School. And uh, Mr. Goins, the wrestling coach, was convicted. He appealed his conviction, and the Court of Appeals upheld the conviction. Uh, and uh, if, you, if you read this case, it's appalling. Um, it goes on for page after page after page after page describing the abuse that went on in the program. Um, and it was, uh, uh, it was things like mismatches on, on the, uh, uh, not only on the wrestling matter of practice, but it was, uh, it was fights, it was uh, uh, trips, and it was sexual activity. Um, it was beating kids up and dressing them up. Um, and uh, using uh, makeup and mascara and lipstick on them and making them uh, uh, 
strip down with like uh, dressing up like girls. It's terrible. Um, it's an awful case. Um, but the the coach had fostered a climate for years on the team, and uh, the, the mantra on the team was, was what happens on trips stays on trips. What happens in the locker room stays in the locker room. Um, so that was a, uh, a culture that had been going on for years and years and years unchecked. Um, it's not too far away from here. Uh, employee use of social media. Uh, again, maintain the highest standards when using social media. This is your local board policy 7335. Um, obviously, again, romantic relationships and communications are prohibited. Um, and you're prohibited from communicating with current students through non-school controlled social media unless you have parental permission. Um, instant messages are a form of social media communication and you're not supposed to have one-on-one -on -one electronic communication without written prior approval of the supervisor and the student's parent. Okay, that's one-on-one -on -one communications. You've got platforms where you communicate uh, to the entire team and to all of the parents, obviously. Um, social media basically includes all kinds of social media. All right. How many of you operate a, uh, how many of you have a blog? Anybody? How many of you run the, uh, the team's portion of uh, the athletic department's website? So if you're the baseball coach, you're not responsible for posting stuff on the, how, and is anybody responsible for, for posting stuff on a website? Okay, a few of you. Okay, now we have a few more. Okay. Um, okay, so this stuff applies to you. You've got to be very careful about what you post on that website and make sure that you're not um, violating any of these standards. Um, it has to be school-related activity that's being posted, and keep in mind the role model standard. Um, use only school control technology and any other form of communication, again, requires prior approval, unless you have that exception of a pre-existing relationship um, with a student or with a student's family. Um, here are some warnings about posting to social media websites. Again, don't post any confidential content. Don't accept students as friends or followers. Okay? That is a, a, a great way to get in trouble inadvertently. You've got students who are friends or followers and you don't think about it and you post something on Facebook um, and it's, uh, or Instagram and it's, it was fun at the time, um, it was fun that night at the party, it was fun while you had a drink in your hand, but now that it's getting retweeted or reposted all over the place and you've had the benefit of a good night's sleep, it may not be the smartest move you ever made. So be very careful about um, allowing students to be uh, friends or followers, prohibited by the board policy. Um, don't allow students to accept, uh, knowingly allow students to accept, access social media websites to have inappropriate content. Um, I had a, a case once where a teacher uh, was having difficulty with some technology. Uh, she let a kid, seventh grade kid, uh, onto her computer because his computer was not working. Uh, her computer was password protected, obviously it was on already, and this kid immediately accessed a sex chat room um, that the teacher had um, on her computer and started uh, chatting with some of the teacher's friends. Um, and uh, somebody in the state of Washington ended up calling the school and saying, uh, I think there's a kid in your school, he's in our sex chat room. Um, and uh, so, anyway, be very careful about allowing anybody to access um, any of your uh, equipment or social media. Uh, that was uh, not a good, not a good look. That uh, was a really interesting chapter, by the way. Um, <laughs> uh, don't knowingly, and, and the key word here is knowingly, but um, don't do it anyway. Um, grant access to sites that are not accessible to the general public. Obviously, profanity, um, any lewd behavior or activity should not be posted. Um, uh, I've got a case going on right now with a coach uh, who's uh, in a beer club, and he posts activities regularly for the beer club, and the beer club has a rack of uh, magazines that some of the guys in the beer club read, um, and um, 
One of them that they proudly display has a centerfold of one of their former students. Um, and so uh, that's, uh, there were some interesting photos there. Um, so not a, good, not a good plan, not a good idea. Um, you're not allowed to use copyrighted materials, and copyrighted materials include team logos without permission. Now obviously if you're using them as part of the school's activities, that's okay. Okay, but if you're posting, for example, and advertising yourself as a private coach um, or a private instructor, or if you're uh, part of a group that runs out facilities on the weekends uh, in order to uh, run a basketball camp, for example, and you're advertising that you are the coach of such and such high school, the home of the Braves, um, and using the team logo there, that's not allowed without permission. Uh, so be careful about that. Um, and that permission has to come from the board because the board owns the copyright to that material. Um, don't use student images without prior authorization. And you get that prior authorization at the start of the season where you're supposed to with the permission forms. Um, don't post anything that's designed to harass, intimidate, or bully anybody else or any inappropriate content, contact, uh, con any inappropriate content that would adversely affect your ability to do the job. Uh, still with the same policy dealing with social media. Um, note that the policy itself says that anything that goes through the school system server can be monitored by the school system. All right. So if you wouldn't want Dr. Lauer reading it, don't go through the school system server. Okay. That's the bottom line there. Um, and any employee who violates that policy can be disciplined. So remember, you're never sure of who it is who's sending you something. You may think you know who's sending you something, but you could be wrong. So be careful about how you respond and what you post. And also remember your passwords and yours. Protect that. All right? And that means don't log kids on to a password-protected system or a password-protected device and then leave them to use it without knowing what they're doing. And don't give out your passwords. Uh, all right, let's talk about students with disabilities for a minute. Uh, in 2013, there was something called a Dear Colleague Letter that came out from the United States Department of Education. A Dear Colleague Letter, or a DCL, as they're called, is a letter that goes out periodically from the U.S. Department of Education, and it goes to every superintendent in America, and sometimes it goes to other folks in addition to school superintendents, depending on the subject of the Dear Colleague Letter may be. So in, in January of 2013, the U.S. Department of Education sent out a Dear Colleague Letter um, that dealt with Section 504 of the Dear Colleague Act of 1973 and extracurricular athletics. So this applies to athletics alone, but same thing can be said, for example, for the band um, or other extracurricular activities. So, Here's what it said. It said students with disabilities have to be provided equal access to existing extracurricular activities. What does that mean, equal access to extracurricular activities? Okay. Well, does that mean that the kid who's a quadriplegic is on the basketball team? No, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't mean that. Um, it doesn't mean, here's what it does not mean does not mean that every student with a disability has the right to be on a team or a group. Nor does it change the nature of selected teams. So if you have kids with tryouts, then a student with a disability um, has the right to compete with everyone else and legitimately earn their place on the team, but they have to earn it just like everybody else does. Um, it doesn't mean that you give a student with a disability an unfair advantage over other competitors, and it doesn't mean that you have to change the essential elements of the game the fundamentals of the game, okay? So that if this kid is in the game and he's a running back and he's disabled, then it's five yards for a first down. Okay, you don't have to change the rules of the game. And it also does not mean that the school districts have to create separate or different activities for disabled students, okay? What it means, though, is you do have to consider um, ways to include kids who have disabilities um, and you may not exclude a student with a disability because you don't think they can do it. Okay? It also means that you can't stereotype kids and you can't make assumptions about students with disabilities. So, 
You have to make an individualized inquiry for every single kid who wants to try out for the team or be in the band or be in the activity and then figure out is there any way we can adapt without changing the nature of the game? Is there any way we can adapt this activity in order to allow this kid to participate? So for example, we have blind wrestlers in North Carolina. Are there any blind wrestlers here in Cabarrus County? Okay. Well, there are several of them throughout the state of North Carolina right now. Um, we have uh, we have deaf uh, kids on the track team who can't hear the starter's pistol, but we adapt by using light. Okay, for the start of the race. Um, so, are there any aids or services that can be provided that would allow the student an equal opportunity to participate? So, what you're looking for is an equal opportunity to participate. So, for example, if you have a kid who's wheelchair bound but wants to be in the marching band, can that kid be in the marching band? Can you think of different ways to adapt the activity so that that kid can be in the band, marching band, if he or she wants to be? Well, yeah, um, that kid can wheel from place to place in the formation. Well, suppose the band director says, well, wait a minute, everybody else has to play their instrument while they're moving from place to place in the formation. Could we have somebody push the wheelchair? Yeah, we could do that. And then that kid could play and be in the formation. Okay. Well, suppose the football coach says, wait a minute, I don't want those wheelchair butts all over the field. Okay, because I know that's what you football coaches were just thinking. Okay? Um, so then what can you do? Well, you can put a little platform maybe on the side of the field um, so that the wheelchair won't create butts and have the kid participate in the marching band, but not have the wheelchair doing runs all over the field. All right, so there are different things you can do, and instead of saying, no, the kid can't do it, the purpose of the Dear Cobbler Letter is to get you thinking of different ways that we can include this kid. Now, suppose a girl wants to try out for a competitive cheerleading, right, and she's disabled to the point where she wouldn't ordinarily make the team in tryouts. Well, you could still give her a couple of pom-poms and let her participate in a different way. So that instead of being involved in all the cheer activities that might involve um, athletic maneuvers or flips or curtains or whatever the cheerleaders are doing, um, she still participates, she still gets a uniform, um, she still gets the pom-poms, but she doesn't do um, some of the competitive cheer activities um, that she's unable to do. Now, if she can do them and, and you can adapt, that's fine, you know, good. Um, so what is an individualized inquiry? It means that you've got to make a reasonable, timely, timely is important. Um, and sometimes with this, I want to focus on timely for a second. Sometimes when these questions come up, it takes a few days to get answers. Um, so the people are saying, well, wait a minute, what do we do now? And then by the time you get answers, the tryout period's over. So you've got to have another tryout for um, this particular kid. So timing is important, but you've got to have a reasonable, timely, good faith effort to um, consult with people who have appropriate knowledge um, and expertise to try and figure out are there any modifications or aids or ways that we can adapt um, that would provide the student with equal access to this activity. So some examples in addition to the ones that I just gave, um, a coach or staff member consults with the student and parents to determine what reasonable modifications could be provided to give that student an opportunity. Um, or a teacher might advise on a coaching modification that could support the student with disability to participate on a team. So go to the teachers who work with this kid and say, what can this kid do? And you're the expert, you work with this kid all the time. Um, you're the EC person. What modifications might be available? Or can you think of different ways um, that we can allow this kid to be? And then, um, I mentioned already the example of the, um, the track student who is deaf and can't hear the starter pistol, you use light instead. Um, you don't have to have a 504 team meeting in order to do this. It's a separate part from a 504 plan for a student with a disability. So, now here's another question. Suppose this kid has an IEP and the IEP that got written without you being involved says that the student participates in your activity. Then what do you do? Well, first of all, that shouldn't have been done probably without consulting with you, but it's happened. Right? And if it happens, then you own it. You're stuck with it. 
um, not allowing the student to participate in an activity set forth in their IEP, their approved IEP, would be a 504 violation. So if you're stuck with it, you own it, figure out a way to deal with it. Um, and then hopefully when the IEP gets revised, you've got to say it um, later on if it's causing you problems. Uh, transporting students, let's talk about that for just a second. Um, you are prohibited from transporting students in your personal vehicle. Now, does that happen? Okay, close your eyes and raise your hands if you think that happens, okay? We won't look, it's not on camera. Okay, close your eyes and raise your hands. Okay, a couple of brave souls. Uh, okay, a couple more. Okay, yeah. Um, it happens, okay? Um, somebody, somebody started out a ride. It's late at night. It's raining. What are you going to do? Okay, your choice is to stay there with the kid or to find a safe way to get the kid home. Um, and so we know this happens sometimes, but it is prohibited um, by your board policies um, for taking kids to your personal vehicle. Now, the bottom line here is you assume personal liability when you do that. Right? Now, you've got car insurance. You're going to be covered, but you do assume personal liability. But you also set yourself up potentially for other claims. If you're alone one on one with the kid, um, whether it's an opposite sex kid or a same sex kid, you're alone with the kid in a vehicle. It could be at night, um, and you set yourself up for um, for potential accusations. Um, but that's not to say that you leave the kid behind. Um, you still got remnants of no child left behind. Um, it wasn't designed for that purpose, but uh, um, we know what happens to um, There is a term listed in the transportation section of the uh, student athlete contra uh, contract that all kids and parents sign and says that they understand that they're responsible for student transportation. Um, in your athletic handbook, you also have requirements dealing with transportation, and that is that students must ride to and from all that pointed at the camera and tag three of the other students who were involved in the conversation. And then there were threats going back and forth. Monday morning came about and there were a bunch of anonymous phone calls from the principal and a bunch of phone calls from parents who identified themselves saying there's going to be a problem. This is, you know, big time. People were sending copies of the photo to the principal. Well, that's obviously a situation where you've got a reasonable forecast of disruption come Monday morning where the kid, the kid with the gun had threatened to kill three others. Um, so uh, the disruption standard is significant here. Um, it's the Tinker standard. Uh, because what we've got when kids are taking a knee is speech on a matter of public concern. It is symbolic speech when they take a knee. And it is on a matter of public concern. Uh, obviously, the, the Black Lives Matter, Blue Lives Matter, All Lives Matter, um, whatever the, the purpose of taking the lead is, it is symbolic protest. So the taker standard applies, and then, uh, but what, is, what does that mean for extracurricular activities? We'll talk about that in a second. For employees, there's a high, there's a different standard, the Garcetti standard. The Garcetti standard um, is another U.S. Supreme Court case, and it basically says that if you're on the job, you don't have a whole lot of freedom of speech if you're on the job. So the question is for employees when you're on the job. Um, and now the question becomes of when and where do these protest activities occur? Well, obviously, if it's in school during the school day, it's one thing. If it's on the football field during the football game, it's another thing. If it's in the stands at the football game, it's something else altogether. So uh, for extracurricular school activities and events, uh, when and where they occur matters. So for example, coaches. Can you tell the coach the coach can't take it in? What do you think? Yes. The coach is on the job. So, um, and, and keep in mind, none of this has been litigated to the point where we've got a case um, uh, right on point here. So I'm, gonna, I'm doing some forecasting here. Okay, but right now I would tell you that my little analysis would be that you can tell the coach you can't take it in. You're on the job, you're representing the school, um, you're wearing the, uh, the team colors, um, the team logo, and you're, you're, on, you're in our employment right now, and you can't take it in. 
right? The coach may respond and say, look, during the national anthem, I'm not doing anything that's a coaching activity. The school system may reply, well, wait a minute, you're a role model. And you're supposed to be role modeling the kind of behavior we want to foster. And the coach can say, yeah, well, taking a knee is encouraging students to exercise their right to freedom of speech. I'm teaching them about the Constitution. So you can go back and forth like that. But I think that while the coach is in your employment, in the employment of the school system, the coach would be told, you can't take a knee. What about the kids on the football team? Did they take a knee? Well, one argument is participation on the football team or in the band or in the chess club is a privilege, it's not a right. And if we set certain standards, that is that you'll stand and respect the flag, um, we could we might be able to enforce that. On the other hand, the kid could say, well, you can't enforce it by violating my First Amendment right to speak out on our matter of concern. It's symbolic speech. So, not sure which way those cases are gonna end up going yet. Schools take disciplinary action to remove students from teams because they're exercising their First Amendment right. What about the band? Can people in the band take a knee while they're performing the national anthem? Well, I think there's a stronger argument that you can tell students that they can't take a knee while they're performing. Okay, any more than students can say, well, I'm going to stand up and protest during the symphony while I'm playing my bassoon, I'm going to stand up and protest instead of sitting down. Or instead of doing the band formation that forms the team logo, I'm going to go off on my own and protest and go to the end zone and play my trumpet. Okay. So you've got, you've got different ways of looking at this right now. Um, for the band members, they're actually performing the national anthem. So the standards of performance, you could probably enforce those more so than you might be able to with the guys on the football team taking it in. What about people in the stands, spectators? Can they protest? Yeah, we don't have any control over them, they, so, so they can protest. What about school employees who are in the stands? Are they on the job when they're in the stands? No. Okay. Suppose they're working the game, though. Okay, well, we've got more control over them if they're working the game. Okay, and the Garcetti standard might apply that is that you don't have a right to be off doing your own thing or, or, or speaking out on a matter of public concern while you're supposed to be doing your job. So lots of different ways to look at this um, <clears throat> through the school setting and, and who is involved in what activity at what time and what place um, is going to, they're all going to be relevant factors. Um, in New Jersey, last week, um, there were a couple of referees who decided that they were going to take this in their own hands. Um, a uh, a father-son referee combination at a high school football game, um, and they said, they went over to the uh, coaches before the game and they said, if any kids take a knee during the national anthem, we're out of here. And sure enough, three or four kids on one of the teams took a knee during the national anthem and these two uh, officials, game officials, left. Okay, now, there were a couple of officials in training who were set to uh, carry the chains and uh, they filled in, so the game went on, and they recruited a couple of parents to do the, the, uh, the chain, run the chains. Okay, and then those two officials got suspended, and now they've been removed from officiating any further games, and now they're suing. Okay, they, get, they said that they're going to sue them for preparing a lawsuit. So um, that's New Jersey's answer. Um, uh, is that the rest of all the people. Um, so. Uh, but I want to finish up by mentioning a few recent cases and, and, uh, and one, uh, one case in North Carolina dealing with coaches. Um, this is a case that just came out of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals on the West Coast uh, in August. Um, it's Kennedy versus the Bremerton School District. And Mr. Kennedy was uh, uh, taking it in a different form, and that is he was praying. 
uh, at, at different points in time during uh, before and during and at halftime of the game. And so what he was doing was he was very publicly saying a prayer prior to the game or immediately after the game and inviting people to come join him. So he was basically leading the team in prayer. Um, the school system told him he can't do that um, and, and told him to knock it off. And then so he went on uh, various different iterations of that so that he'd wait until the kids, the kids left and then he would pray. Um, and so they, they told him to stop doing that. Um, it looks like uh, the school system is endorsing prayer. You're doing it while you were in the, uh, the team jersey and um, uh, not sending the appropriate message here um, with regard to the establishment clause. So, uh, separation of church and state. So, uh, ultimately, they ended up suspending him for a couple of eight games. So, he came to those games and sat in the stands and led prayers in the stands. Um, and then ultimately he was removed as coach. And the court in this case, and this is one notch below the U.S. Supreme Court, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, uh, federal court, said that school officials were okay to suspend him uh, for kneeling at the 50-yard line in view of students and parents immediately after high school football games and disregarding the directions of school officials. So uh, uh, more control over the employee uh, exercising uh, that freedom of religion. This is a case that just came down a couple of weeks ago, Riddle versus the Buckingham County Board of Education. Um, it's kind of an unusual case. Uh, Riddle was the name of a uh, student who was on the football team. And the football coach allowed different students to run the, uh, uh, the gator, uh, carrying the gator with the little uh, uh, John Deere uh, tractor thing, uh, truck thing. And uh, so one student went to get the Gatorade and he was driving recklessly and he was driving straight towards a group of his teammates who were walking towards him and they were kind of having a chicken game. And so the kids scattered and then the kid who was driving the Gator turned suddenly and ran over a teammate and ultimately that kid died. And so Riddle was on the team and watched his teammate that went over and died, and he sued the school system, the kid who was driving the gator, and the coach for negligent infliction of emotional distress for watching his friend get run over and die. And the Court of Appeals uh, upheld the court's ruling throwing that out, saying, no, you don't have enough of a connection here. Um, you just happen to be witness to an unfortunate tragedy. Um, but that's an instructive little case from a lot of different uh, standpoints. And you had a, a kid who didn't have a license who was allowed to drive the gator and was obviously pulling around on it. The coach did it happen before, apparently, and the coach um, didn't do anything to stop it. And tragic result. Uh, Henderson versus the Charlotte Mecklenburg Board of Education is a case that was just decided in May by the North Carolina Court of Appeals. And I want to call your attention to this case because it's really instructive for you for something I mentioned earlier. Um, and let's take a look at this statute, it's 115C, 524C. Um, this is a statute that was, um, uh, that, that I wrote years ago in response to a case that I had where a school system under the Community Schools Act um, had leased out a cafeteria to a, a sorority or a private event. And a couple of members of the sorority decided that they were going to go uh, walking around the school and they walked into a freshly waxed hallway and one of them went um, uh, head over heels and ended up severely injuring herself um, and ended up suing the school system over that. And as a result of that, we looked at the public policy involved in the Community Schools Act and said, wait a minute, the Community Schools Act is designed to encourage community use of school facilities. And if every time the school system runs out there, allows their facilities to be used, they're subject to being sued if somebody gets injured, what's going to happen? They're going to stop running out and allowing people to use the facilities, which is directly opposite of the policy of the Community Schools Act. So in response to that, the General Assembly passed this particular piece of legislation, which says, in 115C, 524C, it says that if you allow an outside group to use a school facility, as long as you do it pursuant to a written agreement, then 
you're immune from liability for any negligence um, that might die, any personal injury that's suffered because of somebody uh, coming in and using that facility. So it's really important to have that written agreement in place beforehand because the written agreement is what protects you. Regardless of what the agreement says, it's the agreement itself that protects you. So in this particular case, Henderson versus the Charlotte Beckenberg Board of Education, the Charlotte Beckenberg Schools rented out several of its facilities to a private organization for a basketball tournament. And one of the gyms that they rented out, apparently the floor was pretty badly warped along the side of, of, of the court. And uh, the referee was running up and down the court and ended up tripping over the warped part of the floor and had really severe injuries, $300,000 worth of medical bills. Okay? Um, so really severely injured. Um, and so Mr. Henderson, the referee, sued the Shulman Mecklenburg Board of Education for these unsafe conditions. And, um, and he said, well, wait a minute, I should be allowed to sue because I don't have a written agreement with the Shulman Mecklenburg Board of Education. Their written agreement was with the basketball group, the group that was running this tournament. And then I contracted with the basketball group to be a referee. And so the court in this particular case said, no, that would violate the purpose of this law in the first place and public policy. And so the court said that um, the school board was still entitled to statutory immunity because the gyms were being used pursuant to that written agreement, even though the agreement wasn't with the individual referee who ended up with a bad injury. Um, and then the last case I want to end with is a case that goes back to 1995. There's another Appeals case. Um, bad person on county accounting of education, and it basically stands for the proposition that you don't have any property interest in a coaching contract. Um, that's basically what it stands for, that um, there is no uh, right to recover for uh, being removed from a coaching position. So, uh, thank you very much for everything you're doing.